Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Devo 30. <clears throat> I am Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. You're also welcome to join us if you're in the neighborhood. We are at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are in 2 Corinthians and we will be looking at chapter 3. <laughs> so if you grab your Bibles, <clears throat> highlighter, your cup of coffee, and Hopefully the Holy Spirit will minister to you this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, for your grace and for your mercies. Afresh every morning, Lord. Thank you for the work that he has done for us that we could not do, Lord, on our own. There was no law that we could follow because we do not follow a law, Lord. We have the tendency, Father, to break that law but your son, Jesus Christ, understanding that, came and he fulfilled the law for us. And we thank you, Lord, for his blood that was shed on the cross for us, his life that was given, and the hope that we have of a resurrected body to eternal security. We ask, Father, that you minister to us now as we dig into your word once again. And may your Holy Spirit be our teacher. May he reveal truth about ourselves that we may confess those things to you lord and ask for forgiveness and continue to grow in our relationship with jesus christ as we are his disciples and it is the holy spirit through jesus christ that we are being taught by him and we pray this in jesus name amen amen, amen. again good morning second corinthians and we are in chapter three chapter three so let's go ahead and just dig right into it starting with verse one Paul goes on and says, do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some other epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? So Paul has been, as you know, defending himself here. <clears throat> he does that in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be looking at chapter uh, 4 this coming Sunday. And he literally defends himself uh, and compares and contrasts to uh, the philosophers of the Corinthians day. These Greek philosophers who felt that they were, they were superior to others. And Paul says, you want to see superiority? Humility is superiority. And we apostles are ones that are humbled by the grace of God. So we don't lift ourselves up, but we walk in humility and here he's still doing the same thing with the with the corinthians where he's saying look um do we commend ourselves can we even commend ourselves can we uh, set a case up to present ourselves to a court or to a group of people and say hey we're worthy for you to listen to i don't know if we can literally do that or not it takes time i believe for something like that to happen you have to listen to a person uh, long enough and then watch their life to say, hey, that's a person I can trust. That's a person I can, I can receive from. There are a lot of people I can receive from and then there's others I just can't receive from. Mm -hmm. You know, ones that are ministers that, that have harmed, harmed me and even the church itself. Um, I, I just can't receive from them because I already know their, their hearts and, and um, their pride in their own life. But those that I do receive from, I've, I've watched. And, and I paid attention and I've heard their words and I received from them. I listened to Pastor Chuck for years before I even attended Calvary Chapel on the radio. So I got to know him through the messages. But then when I saw him, I'm like, wow, I was blown away. Because here is a minister that's nothing like ministers that I've seen before. I mean, Chuck would literally serve. Before service, he was driving around picking up paper and cigarette buds. I don't know of any ministers that really do that to this day. Um, if the restrooms were clogged, he'd be in there unclogging them before service or right after service. He was always serving. Uh, that was his attitude. Um, and my hope is that I can uh, get even close to Pastor Chuck so I can receive from him. No, we can't condemn ourselves, nor can we, as he, as he says here, do we, do we need some sort of letter? Epistle means letter, by the way. When, when you see the New Testament epistles, all it's saying is the New Testament letters. Uh, do we need a letter from someone or do we need a letter from, from you even to condemn, commend ourselves? That's the question here. And of course, it's rhetorical. And the answer is no, we don't, we don't need those letters. 
In fact, all we need is verse 2. You are our epistles, our letter. In other words, uh, written in our hearts, known and ready and read by all men. You are manifestly an epistle of Christ, ministers by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the flesh that is of the heart. That, that's a born-again experience right there. Paul's saying, if you want credentials, you're our credentials. You're our credentials. It's a sad thing when, when you're used by God as an instrument of salvation for someone. And then down the road, they start questioning you. Isn't that sad? There's no appreciation there at all. And here you introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that we're to add a boy them, but God to use them. And then we come against them. And that's what's happening with Paul. Look, you're our epistles. Think about this for a second, guys. All of you are saved. All of you are born again. All of you have come to the knowledge of God because God used us to minister to you. And yet you're questioning uh, us and needing commendations of some sort as though we're you know, false prophets or philosophers of the Greeks. No, 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 something's not right here. No, you are the epistles. God, through the Holy Spirit, has written on your hearts and he has changed you for the better and not for the worse here. So if you want credentials, look at yourself. That's the credentials of God. Um, not, again, not in the sense of boasting, but we get the opportunity to invest in people to pour into them. That's an opportunity that God gives us only by his grace, but it, yet it's an opportunity and we get blessed by it. God actually is going to reward us for it. And yet <laughs> we get that opportunity to pour into someone and see them grow and flourish. Virginia and I, from the time that the boys, I think Modesto was probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight, when I got saved. So from that point on in two years down to where Roman was two or so, we poured into our children. We prayed with them every, let me ask you husbands right now, do you pray with your kids every single night? We prayed with our boys every single night before they went to bed. Do you read with your children every night? Because we read to our children every single night. We watched what they watched on TV. We watched what they were playing as video games. It was during the time when these, these characters, He-Man came out, the little characters. They were, they were animal uh, gods, in a sense, and they would play with these things, uh, Pokemon chips and things like this. And, and we watched everything they did. And if they had any sense of demonic into it, in them, invested in these items, we'd say you can't play with those. We watched what they watched. We were careful to make sure that they were being fed spiritual things. Have you taken your kids to conferences? Have you taken them to church? Have you had them sit down with you during prayer time without phones today? At that time without their little toys and pay attention to learn to pay attention and listen to the preacher actually start praying? Have you done those things? Because we invested all those things into our boys. All those things. And to this day, they're all serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I wish they were serving here, but <laughs> they're not. And God needed to take them away for his purposes. But they're all serving the Lord Jesus Christ because we invested. They are my epistles in a sense of what God has done in my and Virginia's life in training those boys up in the way of the Lord so when they got older, they would not depart from it. And these tablets, he's talking about the tablets of the flesh, kind of like the tablets of the law. It's not the tablets of the flesh, it's of the spirit. And then he goes on, verse four, we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. And it's one of those, again, it's, it's one of those things that it's hard to explain to someone unless they, they are in that position. Uh, Paul is saying here in a sense, look, we, we are sufficient of ourselves, but yet we're not sufficient of ourselves, right? Because it's not in our flesh that we're sufficient, it's in Christ that we're sufficient. He gives us 
the resources, the wisdom, the understanding to, to, to all these things that we need to minister to others. So our sufficiency comes from Christ, but yet we're sufficient. And you tell that to someone else and you're trying to lead and direct them. They're saying, oh, you're just trying to be a boss over me. You're just trying to be like the Gentiles ruling over me. You know, no, that's not the case. Don't you understand, Corinthian, that we're trying to help you grow in your walk to mature? <sighs> and they didn't understand that. So Paul's in a hard place where, where he's trying to teach them, but they're not teachable. They're not willing to hear. They're not at that point yet. And at that point, you really can't do much. You just have to pray and leave them to the Lord. But their sufficiency is from God. Then he goes on and he talks about the law now and the commandments and how much better we have it in, under grace. He says, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So this God, our Father, and Christ and the Holy Spirit has given us this sufficiency to make us ministers. If you were to ask me, when did you feel called to be a minister? I would tell you never. I never felt called to be a minister. The only reason I'm a minister is because God has given me that sufficiency to be a minister. It's not something that I chose. It's something that he gave me. And so I had to basically just be obedient to him. So if anything good comes out of this ministry, which I think God has blessed in so many different ways. <clears throat> it was interesting last night at our meeting, there were several other <clears throat> ministers in our community <clears throat> and they were sharing about the works that they're doing. And they're doing some great works like we are. I didn't realize how many other churches are actually feeding the poor, uh, actually cooking breakfast uh, two times a week. They can come and actually eat there at tables and clothing and so forth. But as they're describing their ministries, they said, We're, we, we here, a few of us here are doing great works like that. And they mentioned my name in our church. And I thought, wow, that was, that was cool because not only does the community recognize us, but even the other churches that are not affiliated with Calvary Chapel, that we're doing a work like they're doing a work also. Uh, using those resources and helping one another. Brother Manny was there, and he was one of the guys, too, that was saying the same thing. So that is because of the sufficiency of Christ Jesus in us that he's done that. It's not that we have decided to become uh, ministers, but it's the Spirit moving us. And we are not ministers of the Old Covenant. We're ministers of the New Covenant. That is the covenant of grace. And how much more does grace help us to be obedient to the law? Does that make sense? No. Let me explain that. If we're under the old covenant, then we're to keep the law in order to be saved, right? That's the old covenant, Ten Commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. If you break the law, you're not saved. You're condemned. In fact, many times you'd be stoned. So, under the new covenant, the covenant of grace through Jesus Christ, now we don't have to keep the law to be saved, but we have to keep the law because we are saved. We should keep the law even more than we did before. Before I got saved, I didn't even think of the Ten Commandments. Oh, I thought, okay, honor God. Well, I know there's a God. I didn't honor him. Respect your father and mother. I, I helped them out as much as I could, but I never really respected them and honored them. Uh, there were times where I was really so selfish, I wouldn't even pick up my mom from work. She worked in El Monte. She lived in Roland Heights. She didn't drive. And after school, she'd call me up. She said, Ruben, I need a ride home. And I'm like, Mom, can't you get someone else? She knows I'm busy. I'm doing things here. Me and Virginia are hanging out. You know, and I'm like, oh, and I'd make a big fuss, and I have to drive all the way there. Going there in the afternoon and back, even at that time, the traffic was pretty bad on the 60 freeway. You'd be bumper to bumper, and I would hate that coming back home. Sitting there bumper to bumper, taking a whole 45 minutes to get to Peck Road. You know, and it, it just, it, it just gnawed at me. And to this point, I didn't honor my father and mother. I didn't do that. Stealing, I stole all the time. You know, I drank all the time. 
I lust it all the time. But you know, once I got saved, I don't do that anymore. It's like, I honor my, my mom, she's now living with us. I take her to the hospital, I take her to the groceries, I take her to the clothes shopping, I, I take her everywhere. Of course, it is a little more convenient, she's living with us, so that helps out, but it's still at times a burden, and you have to crucify the flesh there. You know, I don't steal from people. I don't steal from God. That's, I'm amazed at how many people steal from God. I, I serve in the church here. I'm here at the church, and I see what gets put out and what gets paid for, and I see there's things being taken, you know, and I'm amazed that people can actually live with themselves like that and be okay as they're taking from God. I mean, they have to have a conscience or they're not saved, you know. I think as believers, we're to keep the law even more. We're to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're to be at church, keeping the Sabbath holy. Not because it saves us, but because we are saved. There's a difference there. Uh, and hopefully you see that. And so we are the ministers of the spirit of life, and that is grace. It is grace that gives us the ability to keep the commandments of God. He goes on, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stone was glorious, and it was a glorious thing, so glorious, and he's going to say this in a minute, that Moses shunned, you know, from the glory of the presence of God. It was a glorious thing. He says, it was so glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Isn't that interesting? Even at that moment, it was passing away. The glory in, on Moses was not, was not consistent constant it was literally passing which tells us that the law eventually would be done away with by grace that's what that passing away of his glory on Moses's face was about how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious isn't that amazing the spirit now that dwells within us is even more glorious than the law if we were just to take the time and think about that for a while, that God himself dwells within us. We are the tabernacle of God Almighty, and he dwells in us. And he ministers to us, and he speaks to us, and he leads us, and he guides us through that small, still voice of the Holy Spirit in every decision that we make. That's pretty amazing. The law you had to carry around with you because you didn't have the Spirit. Can you imagine carrying Ten Commandments on big stones? <laughs> Just so I'm reminded. Reminds me of the hippie days when they were so excited they would carry big Bibles. You know, they carried huge Bibles, you know, huge ones. That way they could see, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, I'm letting everyone know I'm a Christian, you know. Of course, we learn that zeal without knowledge. Now we're, we're very more cautious. Uh, too cautious, I think, sometimes. So how much more glorious the Spirit in us? For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory because of the glory that excels for if what is passing away was glorious what remains it's much more glorious again still the law what was passing away the glory of moses the, the law itself was passing away so the law of spirit which is of grace which allows us then to love one another be more concerned for one another, walk in humility. It allows us to do those things instead of being prideful, walking according to the law and being rigid and arrogant and all of those things. That's passing away. But the Spirit is, is even more glorious. Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. I need that line. I need that line. We use great boldness of speech. I think that's my personality, right? When I speak, it's just pretty bold. <laughs> I'm pretty blunt and bold at time. I just say it like it is. I don't, uh, someone the other day said, I, I love the way you teach because you just say it like it is. You don't candy coat it. You don't butter it up. You know, you don't kind of, you know, put a little sweet in it so that it's, it's palatable, you know, that type of thing. I go, I don't know how. <laughs> the word of God is pretty clear. Pretty bold in speech. He says, unlike Moses, verse 13, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away. 
So Moses covered it because he realized that the law was passing away and it would eventually pass away. And he didn't want the children of Israel to see that. Remember, he, uh, he lived during a time without the law. He knew what that was like. Remember Genesis 6? When everybody did what was right in their own eyes, did their own imagination, fulfilled their own lust. Moses saw that. Here we have a law, at least this will keep us in line a little bit. You know, and it'll be in our minds that we're to love God, we're to keep holy the Sabbath, we're to honor our parents, we're to not steal, we're to not covet, and at least this will keep us in line a little bit. And he saw that it was diminishing, so he put the veil over his, his face because he saw the glory of God diminishing. And how dare the glory of God diminish, right? It shouldn't diminish, right? It shouldn't diminish in our life. Application today is, do we diminish the glory of God? Do we make the glory of God less? <clears throat> like we were talking last night, do we make the church uh, presentable to people that they sense the glory of God? Or do, we, or do we just cause such distractions they don't even see the glory of God in it? That's something to think about. How are we leading people to the glory of God? How are we leading them into the presence of God with worship? Uh, with the things that we're doing here. Uh, one of the reasons of just remodeling is not just to remodel, but so that when people come in, they feel at home. They don't look around and go, oh, what a dringy little pace, place. You know, it's like, oh, it's so outdated. You know, that kind of is on their mind and they kind of, oh, I just don't feel like I want to be here. But it, when they come in now, they come in and they go, oh, this is a nice looking place. Wow. And now they're at peace. And then they can receive, and they're not thinking about how ugly the place is. So there's a certain amount of spirituality that went into uh, the remodeling of the church in making it more presentable. Now, you might say, how is that found in the scriptures? Well, look at the, look at the temple. <laughs> look at the temple. I mean, the, when Jesus was walking disciples and, you know, they said, what about the temple? And Jesus was like, beautiful. It's gorgeous. Nothing's as gorgeous as this. I mean, the temple had gold in it. And when they, in AD 70, destroyed it, they burnt it down so they could get all the gold out of it. I mean, it was glorious. They said that when you approached Jerusalem and the sun would rise, it would be a city of gold because you would look at the Temple Mount and it would just shine. For miles and miles and miles, you'd see it. So beautiful. And so we should again, uh, represent God that way in his beauty and splendor. <clears throat> Verse 14, but their minds were hardened for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ Jesus. I missed verse 13. Unlike Moses, uh, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away. So what he's saying today is that there's still a veil over the children of Israel. Uh, they're still seeing the law, but they can't see clearly. But even, verse 15, to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. So not necessarily a literal veil, but a spiritual veil on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Isn't that interesting? I, I think of our brother that we're going to be posting something on. He's a Jew. Uh, he's what they call a completed Jew. It's hard for Jewish people to receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And here he is. A veil was put before him. He received the Lord Jesus Christ. That veil was literally removed. And now he's a completed Jew. He's, a, he's one of the tribes of Israel that has come back to the Messiah as Yahshua in his life. And it's neat seeing what God is doing in his life. But that's hard. There's still a veil on the Jewish people. <clears throat> now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty. What does that mean, there's liberty? We get so confused over this word. Where there's the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. We think the liberty is to do whatever we want to do. Nuh uh that's not what he's talking about. The liberty is that we have the liberty now to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's liberty. That's liberty. We have the liberty 
without restraints to be used of God according to His will in His plan. We have the liberty not to be under laws. And I'm talking about religious laws. I'm not talking about order of functions in churches. I'm talking about religious laws that proposably gets you closer, draws you closer to God, or saves you. That's bondage. Liberty from those laws so that we could have order within the church. For instance, speaking in tongues as we saw uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, there's an order. You would say, well, I have liberty to speak in tongues. Why can't I just speak in tongues? And someone else says, I have liberty too to speak in tongues. Now you've got 100 people speaking in tongues. And Paul comes in and says, hey guys, it's not helping. Let's have some order. Only two or three speak at the most and then let there be an interpretation. That way people get blessed by it. That's order. That's not putting us under the law or a yoke again. It's actually liberating us so that we get benefit from the order of tongues. It's quite simple. So that we get order from the service and how the service functions and runs. It's not a yoke, as some would say that. I remember years ago when uh, the Calvary, where I was going to, decided that they were going to ask all the children to go to the classrooms and they could no longer stay in the sanctuary because they were being a, a great distraction. And I tell you, that church just blew up. They blew up. Oh, you're legalistic. You're putting bondage on us. You don't get it. You're like the Pharisees. And a few who were elders were saying these things. They didn't understand the scriptures. They didn't understand the scriptures at all. Um, they could not see beyond the, that fact that it was, all they saw was you're telling us what to do and we don't like that. And people don't like that. I know that. And instead of saying, look, it's good for the children. They'll be in classes for their own age. They'll be getting taught at their own speed. They won't be in here distracting people who are trying to hear the worship and hear the message. It's good for all of us. All they saw was pharmaceutical attitude. You know, and it was a big thing. And they brought up scriptures like this. Where's the liberty that we have in Christ? Well, you're pulling it out of context. That's not what he's saying here. Look at the next verse. But we all... With unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the purpose is, is that, <clears throat> that, we, um, that we become more like Jesus, right? Amen. And wouldn't it be nice, because I think we're breaking this law if we were to keep the kids in here. Jesus said, fret not the little ones to come unto me. And if we keep them in here, do you know how little kids respond to boring church services? They're not receiving anything from the Lord. So if anything, we're keeping them from Jesus, from learning at their pace. Coloring pictures of Jesus and coloring this and that. Where they're getting this stuff in their minds and they're coloring and doing something with their hands. That's good for them. But we don't see that. Our pride kicks up. You can't tell us what to do, especially with our kids, you know, that type of thing. And that's sad because it did destroy the church. It really did. Uh, very good friends, too, of, of many people um, that couldn't see the wisdom in, in that. So, the liberty of Christ. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. Please, prayerfully consider sharing this on your wall. And maybe someone else will be blessed by it. God bless you. If you have any prayers, please post them or private message me and we will pray for you. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.